Imagine making a video when the topic is relevant. 2020 was a year that happened. I don't think I need to go any deeper into that. And to, uh, celebrate, I'm going to make a top 10 video because it's an easily digestible cliche format that gives me an excuse to ramble on about games that I like. 2020 had a lot of staying inside, and while you could no longer go on a casual stroll and enjoy the fresh scent of Kmart, it meant that... Mom, Dad, it's gamer time. No! Oh god, I'm not gonna qualify, I'm done. All in all, I played some pretty good games for the first time last year, so I'm just gonna rank the 10 that were my favorite. It's really not much more complicated than that. This is obviously all just my opioid addiction, and it's bound to change in the future, so take these rankings with a grain of salt. I won't bore you with any more exposition. Let's just get started. Crash Bandicoot 2 is the best Crash game, at least coming from an expert such as myself. I've experienced all the classics, such as Crash Bandicoot, Crash Bandicoot 2, those are the only two Crash games that I played. My first console ever was a PS2, yet I never really experienced any of the exclusives growing up. I mostly just stuck to licensed games. I know, it was a bad decision, but I was like six, sue me. It wasn't until I got the Insane Trilogy that I got to experience Crash Bandicoot. I haven't even finished the trilogy yet, so my knowledge is quite limited, but what I will tell you is that Crash 2 is a very solid platformer. Crash 1 also had the pacing that makes the gameplay in this series so enjoyable, but with that game, its age would often show a lot more with the slower movement and weird depth perception. The depth perception in Crash 2 was practically no different, with the games sharing the same engine and all, but the improved movement made these issues a lot less noticeable. You can now slide, and do other stuff too, but come on, that's a good one. Sliding lets you gain momentum unlike anything in the first game, so you can safely land your jumps when the depth perception could otherwise be wonky enough to throw you off. And I mean, it's just more fun. Complementary to the better controls is the level design, which is a step up from Crash 1 in almost every way. I won't act like it's perfect, as the ice physics and jetpack were just... <clears throat> Icky. But most of the gimmicks made for some pretty nice challenges. I particularly like the B levels, which provide a dynamic of going above ground to jump over pits and burrowing underground to avoid bees. And uh, you can also kick the bees. The sewer levels, among others, were also enjoyable not only for the creative gimmicks, but also for having stronger atmosphere than what you'd expect from Crash Bandicoot. Levels in general feel denser, with more secrets to find, and I think it summarizes Crash 2 as a whole. It shows its age as a PS1 game, but it's a fun PS1 game. Halo 3 ODST is your typical Halo game, except it really isn't at all. Believe it or not, this used to be one of the more controversial Halo games. God, we were spoiled back then. Similar to what would later be done with Reach, Halo 3 ODST takes the focus away from Master Chief to tell a story elsewhere in the Halo universe. This is all fine and good, but what separates ODST from Reach is in its gameplay structure. You have your usual combat and missions, but in between all of that are moments where you just wander the streets of a semi-open world new Mombasa. Other Halo games had and would continue to have open levels, but the Mombasa streets take it a step further. There are no blatant linear paths to objectives, and you're even given a map as the area is vast enough to easily get lost in. Enemies are scattered about, yet somewhat scarce in New Mombasa, giving it a much more desolate, lonely feeling. Again, atmosphere isn't anything new to this series, but wandering the rainy night in the hauntingly quiet city is just something special, man. I do think it's worth mentioning that the traditional campaign is solid in its own right, but it sort of pales in comparison to the wild campaigns of some of the other Halo games, as well as the new stuff that 3 ODST introduces. Mechanics such as the truly open world environment, the visor, and even the inclusion of audio logs have yet to see a return of the series, and I can understand why as they don't really feel Halo-like, but I'm glad they got experimental, even just this once. Let me just ask you a simple question. What if they made a video game with zombies where, get this, you shoot the zombies with guns? Most likely you're like, wait a minute, 
that's real. You have good games, you have really good games, and then you have zombie games. Okay, maybe it's my fault if I'm missing out on some good games, but a lot of these just seem to blend together in a giant puddle of mediocrity. I'm not the first to say that the market for zombie video games is so oversaturated to the point where the concept of zombies is hardly scary or interesting anymore. But, Valve made a zombie game. Do you know what else Valve made? Heavy Weapons Guy. Maybe I was motivated to play Left 4 Dead 2 based on the widespread positive reception it has coming from a time when zombies weren't so stale, but I know what I played and I know how much fun I had. I can understand why people would want a slower, realistic approach with this theme, but Left 4 Dead 2 is fast and I welcome that. The game keeps elements of survival, but it just takes 5 seconds to heal as opposed to No Man's Sky's development time. The gunplay is admittedly simple with a few perks to spice it up, but it gets the job done and still makes it fun to plow through a bazillion zombies. Teammates are equally important to the gameplay as your own combat skills, because unique zombie variants can often render a player immobile, requiring help from another player. This incentivizes players not to hog all of the best items, as letting other characters take resources can be just as crucial in ensuring survival. With zombie games, devs often try one of two approaches when it comes to tone. It's either super serious with a sprinkle of sarcasm from the writing, or completely silly. Left 4 Dead 2 strikes a beautiful balance between the two. Maybe this is due to the uncanniness of the Source engine, but some of these maps just look really spooky. Combine this with amazing use of lighting, fog, and sound cues, and the sense of urgency is raised quite high at times and you can't forget about the witches. On the other hand, there's the characters. You better get the pumps to clean out Shakespeare's coffin after he's done pissing himself because this writing brings a tear to my eye. Get that thing on my back! Ellis! Ellis, is that you? What the hell? Oh shit! Explosive rounds here! Ah! I'm telling you, Coach is the next heavy weapons guy. Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon took me two years to complete. Luigi's Mansion 3 took me a week to complete. Now this isn't because Dark Moon was so much harder, nor was its campaign that much longer, but rather that Luigi's Mansion 3 had me far more engaged the entire time. Dark Moon isn't a bad game, but even as a kid I always found its pacing to be really weird. The mission structure attempted to be fitted for smaller bursts of play on a handheld, yet I always found it tedious how some of the missions would purposefully block off certain areas, yet require a level of backtracking, which kinda drove me to take long breaks from the game. Luigi's Mansion 3, however, takes this criticism to heart and balances the longer playtime of Dark Moon with the more immersive structure of the original Luigi's Mansion. Rather than going on a mission structure that would arbitrarily divide the action up and make exploration feel less meaningful, Luigi's Mansion 3 is divided up by the different floors that make up the hotel. Each floor has its own map that can be fully explored from the outset, minus obvious progression tools such as keys, without EGAD calling constantly, telling Luggy to get his stupid ass back to the lab. At the same time, the more elaborate design of the first game could be overwhelming with a lot more content, so the floors make it to where it's easier to remember where you are and what you should be doing if you put the game down for a while. Additionally, each floor's distinct theming, along with the fitting puzzles and Luigi's most expansive toolkit yet, gives this game the most gameplay variety seen in the series. Mario's even green in this game and he goes through walls because he's like a ghost or something. Boss fights here also borrow from the previous games for the better. The ghosts themselves have unique designs akin to the portrait ghosts from the first game, yet they also brought back ghosts possessing other objects in Dark Moon, which was a cool idea but didn't always result in the best execution previously. The mechanics were memorable, the designs were memorable, just a really great boss roster all around. Just a great game all around. And it even has Scare Scraper. Nintendo Online is usually a complete joke, and don't get me wrong, this could have been a whole lot better, but I played this almost as much as I played the main story. The random layouts give this mode so much replayability, and I, I swear I'm a child, but I would always get excited upon seeing new rare ghosts appear. Best of all, 
It doesn't run like Microsoft PowerPoint 1963. Win. Genshin Impact stands out from other free-to-play games because it's actually fun to play. Say what you will about this game being a Breath of the Wild ripoff, but I would absolutely take this over more boring-ass pay-to-win clickers that dominate the free-to-play market, especially on mobile. I would even agree that the claim that Genshin rips off Breath of the Wild has some merit as it does take a ton of ideas from that game. How good they do the game varies. Some of the more specific stuff, such as enemy designs being fairly generic versions of Breath of the Wild's creatures, makes the experience feel a little unoriginal. Hilly churls are basically bacoblins, slimes are choo-choos, Fatui agents are Yiga clansmen, rune guards are guardians, I'm sure you're seeing a pattern here. More general mechanics though, like the ability to climb just about any surface, and filling in the world map by visiting special waypoints, will always be welcome in my eyes as they're fun elements that other games should take from Breath of the Wild. The huge world is impressive in its own right, but where Genshin really shines is in its combat and character progression. Genshin Impact's combat is heavily based on combos, whether that's through various elemental reactions or stat buffs caused by character abilities. It leaves a a lot of room for experimentation as just about any team can produce deadly damage numbers with the right setups. The characters themselves are pretty excellent in terms of both gameplay and personality, even if one of those might be coming from the degenerate's perspective. I definitely have my gripes with the gotcha system and the fact that chances to wish are extremely limited, but the game gives you a decent selection of characters right off the bat to where it's always possible to progress in the game without spending money or grinding for hours. What are you talking about? I don't need Hu Tao. Silly churl, billy churl, silly billy hilly churl, Ooh. <laughs>I just gotta say, while this might be a part of just about every RPG out there, leveling up your characters and seeing them grow stronger is just so satisfying. It's something Breath of the Wild chose not to do, but I'm glad that it's here. This game was kind of hard to rank as a majority of the story isn't even out yet and it could change a lot over the next few years, but I thought number 6 was a comfortable spot as the game really hooked me over the past few months. He's hoping the devs make it an even better game in the future. Demon Souls is the Dark Souls of the Dark Souls series. It's a very new and weird IP with crazy boss battles and an unforgiving difficulty- Shit, I got the wrong footage, didn't I? No, I do not have a PS5. Demon Souls may have been a lot less known than the titan that Dark Souls would become, but it was the first time that From Software attempted this now iconic form of gameplay, commonly dubbed Soulsborne. This gameplay style is often associated with a stamina bar, dodging through invincibility frames, and of course, high difficulty. So technically, AR-50 and Genshin Impact could be considered Soulsborne. But anyways, being the first go at a new idea, it brought some truly exceptional elements, but simultaneously aged poorly in some areas. Even something that seemed like a staple in Dark Souls 1 like the plunging attack was absent here, and it felt kinda weird not to have it when it really would've been beneficial. The level design and boss fights can feel like a very mixed bag. I'd say most of them aren't terrible at the very least, but sore thumbs like the trash tier stealth boss Dragon God and the entire Valley of Defilement are hard to ignore. While none of the good parts reach the polish that From Software can achieve today, you can tell they put a lot of thought and care into making every major encounter feel unique. My favorite boss has to be the old hero. Most video game bosses are programmed to know exactly where the player is at all times, with the challenge being to dodge attacks, and Demon Souls is no exception at least until reaching Old Hero. It's not explicitly explained, which is basically a given for Soulsborne at this point, but the boss is actually blind and he reacts to the sound of your movement. This adds an extra dimension to the fight as you don't have to dodge his crazy attacks head on, but can actually lighten your load and make it harder for the boss to track you. I also like the Adjudicator. He's not a great boss, he's just a funny guy. Don't get me wrong, I love the crack Beyblades that Dark Souls 3 blessed us with, but this type of experimentation is something you rarely get anywhere else.
Eve is a free horror game made in RPG Maker that I somehow enjoyed enough to put this high on the list. But I actually do know why it's this high. There's always something I found really charming about the concept of RPG Maker horror games. The fact that there's no budget for anything flashy, just one developer's crazy imagination, and the medium with which they use to convey it. Out of all these horror games I've played, which isn't a ton to be fair, Eve is my favorite without question. The whole premise is that you play as a young girl named Eve who goes into a painting gallery with her parents. You wander off for a bit and then you find yourself in a spooky painting world with mannequin heads and scary painting ladies. The gameplay is pretty standard stuff. You wander the world in a top-down perspective, all the while solving puzzles and avoiding monsters. The story and atmosphere are the real reasons as to why Eve is such a special game. I feel like everybody says this about the horror content they recommend, but there's no jump scare let's play or bait in Eve. It's not so much made to scare you as it is to unnerve you, yet fascinate you. You meet characters throughout your journey, which I found myself growing quite attached to, especially considering how short this game is. I would like to go more in depth, but it would just spoil the entire game. I could try to pinpoint moments, but it really doesn't have the same effect unless you understand the bigger picture. <laughs> bigger picture. It's just something you have to experience for yourself if it sounds like your sort of thing. It may have not taken the most hours from me, but the way the story elements come together in the end creates a beautiful piece that I won't forget for a long time. Does Halo 3 even need an introduction? It was one of the most hyped games of all time, and still is in some ways, and I haven't got around to really sinking my teeth in until the MCC came to Steam. I wouldn't say it's my personal favorite Halo game, but if you grew up on this, you had a great childhood. Better than the kids growing up with Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I said the words, can I have my reddit platinum now? Anyways, Halo 3 had a huge legacy to live up to with everything Halo 2 accomplished, and I'd say it lived up pretty well. While not every campaign mission is a winner in my book, the amount of times my excitement peaked couldn't even be counted. I was told that the Ark and Halo were some of the greatest missions in the series, and I can't really contend with that after playing them. The Covenant feels like everything the Halo trilogy was building up to, and it's just so cool. Again, not every mission is like this, but the good stuff is perfectly spread out to where things won't be dull for long. Something I really won't contend is that Halo 3 is the king of multiplayer. Halo has always been a blast in multiplayer from day one, but it hasn't been perfect. CE had broken pistols, 2 had broken battle rifles, Reach had some particularly annoying abilities, and so on. I would be hard pressed to call Halo 3's multiplayer absolutely flawless, but there's nothing huge that sticks out as an issue for me. The weapons feel nice to use and are balanced, and the maps are generally really fun to play on. Guardian, Avalanche, Sandtrap, Standoff, Valhalla, these are just some of my favorites in the game. Rat's Nest? That's what I'm talking about. It's also worth mentioning that the sandbox in this game is just gigantic. It had so much stuff, so many options. It had vehicles like the Elephant and Chopper that wouldn't make a proper return after Halo 3. It gave us equipment for the first time. Even after every amazing thing that Halo 1 and 2 sandboxes brought, Halo 3 still managed to make those games feel small in comparison. You know when a game comes out and is amazing, but the sequel does just about everything so much better? I don't want to lose anyone here, but I personally think that's kinda neat. Doom 2016 ran, so Doom Eternal can drive a freight train. Combat in Doom has a lot of flash for that instant gratification adrenaline rush, but includes more nuanced mechanics like skills and perks to make the combat a lot deeper than it might appear at first glance. Doom Eternal realizes there's no fixing to be done with this formula, and just focuses on refining it to a T by adding cool shit we didn't even know we needed. Your arsenal in this game is massive, yet having abilities on cooldown that allow you to infinitely generate resources encourages you to use just about everything you got. 
Doom Eternal isn't a slow game of ultra-conservative ammo management. You can just dump about every bullet into the biggest threat and regenerate it all later. That's not to say it's mindless, though. You have to make your decisions quick and constantly be on the move unless you want to die instantly. It's one of those games you just play and it's almost like it was perfectly manufactured to be engaging. Your arsenal isn't the only thing that got bigger, as the demons also have returning in completely new creatures in their ranks. Dread Knights, Whiplashes, Doom Hunters, along with every major boss in the game, not only look awesome, but have their own strengths and weaknesses that make you consider how you approach every combat encounter. And is, it, is that the pain elemental? Is that the best demon? Of course, the centerpiece of every fight is the level design. It was already phenomenal in Doom 2016, with tons of secrets and layers to each arena, but Doom Eternal touches up in ways that make it just a bit nicer. The additions to Doom Guy's movement allow for levels to take on platforming layouts that wouldn't have been compatible in Doom 2016, and while this might be a more personal thing, I like how the levels in Eternal are a lot more varied in color schemes. I know that taking place on Mars and in Hell will mean that things will be predominantly red, but I still felt like the visual design got a little samey in Doom 2016. I think some diversion while sticking to the theme makes each level just a bit more memorable in my eyes. Number 4 is Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Being somebody who hasn't played the first game, even though I definitely plan to get it once the remake drops, so yeah. What did I think of Xenoblade Chronicles? Look, I love RPGs. I love JRPGs. Xenoblade Chronicles is straight up one of the best things ever. I'm gonna try to keep my Xenoblade 2 recap very short. It was the first Xeno game I played, which I enjoyed on my first playthrough whilst acknowledging its shortcomings, but would soon become infatuated as I return and dive into the hefty amount of side content it had to offer. The game still has its share of flaws, but I still could not not love it. Xenoblade Chronicles fits a very similar role as it has weaker aspects, yet the charm and polish minimize anything that would otherwise bother me. Just to make this clear, I played the Definitive Edition, so it essentially fixed issues that plagued the original releases. The combat itself doesn't have quite as much depth as in Xenoblade 2, but there are a lot of small things that make it feel nicer here in areas. Being able to auto-attack while moving is one of my favorite differences from 2, as position can be crucial in scoring attack bonuses against enemies. The Definitive Edition also improved the UI so that it's a lot more transparent when you are in a position to score damage bonuses and when certain buffs or debuffs are active. The amount of options for arts you can use at any given time and the various team compositions and strategies to consider, even outside of battles, made it to where the combat never got stale for me. Monado Visions also provided a nice way to counter strong enemy attacks. You don't have to accept taking huge sums of damage as you can just warn party members, granted you manage the party meter wisely. Even outside of battle, Xenoblade is an absolute joy to play. Most of the time will be spent exploring the vast landscapes of the Bionis and Mechanis, which act as incredibly detailed environments and are all around just amazingly designed. There's so much to discover, so much to find, so many unique monsters to fight that the simple movement doesn't even hurt the experience as you're so busy taking everything in. It was already pretty impressive on the Wii, but the Switch visuals make this world feel even more fully realized. Natural formations and mechanical structures offer a stark contrast, yet both can prove to be equally beautiful. Even with all of these amazing qualities, the story is what people often remember the most, and I can say that it is one of the best stories I've ever heard. Period. The characters you travel with are just so likable, and even the antagonists you encounter have value in providing insight into this game's conflict. Like with Eeb, I really don't want to spoil specifics about the plot. It twists and turns in so many ways, yet it all comes together for one of the most jaw-dropping finales I have ever seen. To top everything off, this game's soundtrack is so good. So yeah. Xenoblade Chronicles is my favorite game I've played all year, without a doubt. And frankly, it's one of my favorites of all time. Thanks for watching.